Tom Swift and his electric runabout by Victor Appleton Chapter Seven Tom is Captured Meanwhile the young inventor, aided by his father, Mr Sharp, and Garrett Jackson, the engineer, worked hard over his new car and the powerful batteries. A month passed, and such was the progress made that Tom felt justified in making formal entry of his vehicle for the races to be held by the Touring Club of America. He paid a contingent fee and was listed as one of the competitors. As is usual in an affair of this kind, the promoters of it desired publicity, and they sought it through the papers. Consequently, each new entrant's name was published. In addition, something was said about his previous achievements in the speed line. No sooner was the name Tom Swift received by the officials of the club than it was at once recalled that young Swift had had a prominent part in the airship Red Cloud and the submarine Advance. This gave an enterprising reporter a chance for a special for the Sunday supplement of a New York newspaper. Tom, it was stated, was building a car which would practically annihilate distance and time, and there were many weird pictures showing him flying along without touching the ground in a car, the pictorial construction of which was at once fearful and wonderful. Tom and his friends laughed at the yarn at first, but it soon had undesirable results. The young inventor had desired to keep secret the fact that he was building a new electric vehicle and a novel storage battery, but the article in the paper aroused considerable interest. Many persons came a long distance, hoping for a sight of the wonderful car, as pictured in the Sunday supplement, but they had to be denied. The news thus leaking out kept the swift shops almost constantly besieged by many curious ones who sought by various means to gain admission. Finally, Tom and his father, after posting large signs warning persons to keep away, added others to the effect that undesirable visitors might find themselves unexpectedly shocked by electricity if they ventured too close. This had the desired effect, though the wires which were strung about carried such a mild charge that it would not have harmed a child. Then the only bothersome characters were the boys of the town, and fearless and careless lads, they persisted in hanging around the swift homestead, in the hope of seeing Tom dash away at the rate of five hundred miles an hour, which one enthusiastic writer predicted he would do. I've got a plan, exclaimed Tom one day when the boys had been particularly troublesome. What is it? asked his father. We'll hire Eradicate Sampson to stand guard with a bucket of whitewash. He'll keep the boys away. The plan was put into operation, and Eradicate and his mule, Boomerang, were installed on the premises. Deed and I'll keep dem lads away, promised the colored man. I'll splash white stuff all over em if they comes trespassing around me. He was as good as his word, and when one or two lads had received a dose of the stuff, which punishment was followed by more severe from home for having gotten their clothes soiled, the nuisance ceased, to a certain extent. Sam Snedeker and Pete Bailey were two who received a liberal sprinkling of the lime, and they vowed vengeance on Tom. And Andy Foger will help us too, added Sam as he withdrew after an encounter with Eradicate. Don't uh, let that boy you, Mr. Swift, exclaimed the darky. Just let that low down good for nothing Andy Foger come round me, and I'll make him think he'd be inside of a chicken coop. That's what I will. Perhaps Andy heard of this and kept away. In the meanwhile, Tom kept on perfecting his car and battery. From the club secretary, he learned that a number of inventors were working on electric cars, and there promised to be many of the speedy vehicles in the race. After considerable labor, Tom had succeeded in getting together one set of the batteries. He had them completed one afternoon and wanted to give them a test that night but when he went to his father's chemical laboratory for a certain powder which he needed to use in the battery solution, he found there was none. I'll have to ride into Mansburg for some, he decided. I'll go after supper on my motorcycle and test the battery tonight. The young inventor left his house immediately after the evening meal. Along the road towards Mansburg he speeded, and as he came to the foot of a hill where once Andy Foger had put a big tree hoping Tom would run into it, and be injured, the youth recalled that circumstance. 
And he has been keeping out of my way lately, mused Tom. I wonder if he's up to any mischief. I don't like the way Sam Snedeker is hanging around the shop, either. It looks as if they were plotting something. But I guess Eradicate and his pail of whitewash will scare them off. Tom got the powdered chemical he wanted in the drugstore, and after refreshing himself with some ice cream soda, he started back. As he rode along through the streets of the town, he kept a lookout, and those of you who know how fond the lad was of a certain young lady do not need to be told for whom he was looking. But he did not see her, and soon turned into the main highway leading to Shopton. It was dark when he reached the hill, where once he had been so near an accident, and he slowed up as he coasted down it, using the brake at intervals. Tom got safely to the bottom of the declivity, and was about to turn on the power of his machine when, from the bushes that lined either side of the roadway, several figures sprang suddenly. They ranged themselves across the road, and one cried, Halt! in tones that were meant to be stern, but which seemed to Tom to tremble somewhat. The young inventor was so surprised that he did not open the gasoline throttle nor switch on his spark. As a consequence, his motorcycle lost momentum, and he had to take one foot from the pedal and touch the ground to prevent himself from toppling over. "'Hold on there!' cried another voice. "'We've got you where we want you now. Hold on. Don't go.' "'I wasn't going to,' responded Tom calmly, trying to recognize the voice, which seemed to be unnatural. "'What do you want, and who are you?' "'Never mind who we are. We want you, and we've got you. Get off that wheel.' I don't see why I should, exclaimed Tom, and he suddenly shifted his handlebars so as to flash the bright headlight he carried upon the circle of dark figures that opposed his progress. As the light flashed on them, he was surprised to see that all the figures wore masks over their faces. Tom started. Was this the happy Harry gang after him again? He hoped not. Yet the fact that the persons had on masks made the hold-up have an ugly look. Once more, Tom flashed the light on the throng. There were exclamations of dismay. Douse that glim, somebody! Called a sharp voice, which Tom could not recognize. A stone came whizzing through the air from someone in the crowd. There was a smashing of glass as it hit the lantern, and the road was plunged in darkness. Tom tried to throw one leg over the saddle and let down the supporting stand from the rear wheel, so the motorcycle would remain upright without him holding it. He determined to have revenge for that act of vandalism in breaking his lamp. But just as he was free from the seat, he was surrounded by a dozen persons, and several hands were laid on him. "'We've got you now,' someone fairly hissed in his ear. "'Come along, and get what's coming to you.' Tom tried to fight, but was overpowered by numbers, and, a little later, was dragged off into the woods in the darkness by the masked figures. His arms were securely bound with ropes, and a handkerchief was tied over his eyes. Tom Swift was a prisoner. 